I know. I did it again. I did it again. I did it again. You would think that I've been doing this for 14 years. And the software updated again, and it defaults to the muting on the microphone. And that's what happens. And I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see. So I'm going to rewind. I'm going to start all over again. Uh, thank you. Welcome. A lot of fun tonight. If you're watching live, tag and invite a friend. Grab a snack. If you're watching on replay, 7.30 p.m. Eastern every Wednesday night. Also, tag and invite a friend. Really excited tonight. Lots of fun stuff to talk about in world, on screen. Surprises over here. I mentioned Mouse Fan Travel. They just announced that there's new 2022 room and packages now available. Go visit them at mousefantravel.com for a free no obligation quote. You would think that after all this time, I would finally start getting this down. And remember, I even said to myself, Lou, they just updated the software. Make sure you go and check. And I didn't because I get excited. And this is exactly why I love live video. Why? Because it's it's human and we make mistakes and I'm juggling a lot. There's a lot going on on the opposite side that you can't see and under here and everywhere. So uh, thank you and sorry. And I knew when I saw Becky Mankin calling me, I knew that I must have done something completely horrific. And that's when I started to panic and said, oh, it's the same thing again. But hi, I'm Lou. I'm human. You're my friend. I'm excited that you're here. A lot of fun stuff to get to tonight. Uh, I think we should probably now that now that I can see now we can get now we can get right into it. So thank you very much for everybody who is texting me in uh, in a panic stricken mode as you were. So uh, yeah, sorry about that. But <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's get right into it. Great. First of all, speaking of thanks, I want to quickly say thanks to some of the new and longtime members of the WW Radio Nation family, including Mike Decutis. Connor B, Mike Pascarello, Kaylee Shu, and long, long time, going back to the Mouse Tunes days, Joy Johnston. You literally, you help keep the microphone and the, and the, wait, you help keep the lights and the microphone on as well. So uh, to find out how you can be part of the Nation family, go to www.radionation.com. Lots of fun stuff over there too. Usually the microphone is on. Oh, and I also explained this. Uh, it is not dirt. These are ashes. I get it every single year. Lou, you forgot to shower. No, I just, I have my ashes on from today. So uh, I think that's it. I think I've recapped everything that you didn't hear me say. And I need to start putting like closed captioning on the I'll be something else that I would forget about too. So anyway, I'm so excited that you are here. I see there's a lot of new and longtime friends who are here watching tonight. Some friends who haven't been able to be here in a long time, so thank you very, very much for uh, for bearing with the audio problems and joining me tonight. Uh, all right, I think we should just get right into it. Let's let's talk first things first. Let's talk about this week's podcast, the part two of our secrets and illusions in Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World with my friend Matthew Krull from the Imagineer podcast. I uh, really had a good time, sort of virtually touring the parks. If you've taken a listen. Let me know in the comments. Let me know what either you learned from this week's show, one of your favorite illusions or special effects or secrets, or if we missed anything, and I'm sure that we did because the show was only like two and a half hours long, if we missed anything, and believe me, I've gotten emails. Lou, how could you not mention the stretching portraits? I know, we couldn't mention everything, but let me know what it is that you missed. Uh, Curtis says it was an excellent podcast. Uh, David Seidelberger, long time, been a long time. Good to see you again. And uh, I am not giving up Facebook for Lent. Um, giving stuff up for Lent, I, I listen, because giving up Facebook would mean giving up my friendship with you, right? Or at least sort of putting it to the side. And I don't want to do that. Um, you have no idea how important Wednesday night is to me. I, I know a lot of you say how much you look forward to it, um, you know, both on the show and privately to me. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy Goff says, ashes, wait, ashes on, microphone off. That's the way Lou likes to roll. You know, I like to mix things up a little bit. I want to make you sort of work for the entertainment value. So lip reading is clearly a, um, it's a, it's a prerequisite to, um, to watching the show. My buddy Chuck Lionberger, Chuck, thank you, brother. Huge shout out to the presentation to the PRSA chapter. Blue Ridge uh, was incredible wealth of information. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person buddy and uh but thank you very much for reaching out to me again i still remember coming up there and going up to the blue ridge blue ridge highway blue ridge 
something way and the big star and eating well and good friends and all that kind of stuff too. So uh, Brian says he's having a hard time hearing me and he's got it turned up to 11. So I'm going to, I'll even turn my microphone up a little bit more for you. If you're having a tough time hearing me, listen, this is what happens in live video. This is what happens when you uh, host and produce and monitor the comments and do all of it by yourself. So um, anyway, thank you. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the kind words about the show. Matt was a lot of fun to uh, record that with. Things Lou won't give up for Lent, Disney Plus, Boathouse and Sushi. You are correct on all three because it's my job. Like I couldn't give it up, right? It would be like giving up your job for Lent and I, and I couldn't do that. Give myself a little high five underneath. Uh, so um, it's the Blue Ridge Parkway. I know highway, parkway, freeway. I know there was some sort of Blue Ridge something way in there. Brian Donovan, long, long, long. Brian Donovan goes all the way back to the, uh, the early days of the WW Radio Forum. So Lou will have to eat only at the boathouse on Fridays during Lent. Paul Clark, that is not a bad way to, uh, to not eat meat on Fridays. Uh, although uh, super Catholic, I try and like do the fasting thing like today. If I that's wait, that's my excuse. I've been fasting all day today. That's why I forgot to turn on the microphone. So there you go. I could use I could use like a month's worth of fasting. That's why I'm wearing dark clothes and a hooded sweatshirt tonight. So, um, yeah, Carlos, what happens in live video? Um, no, <laughs> Jeffrey says podcast idea, Lenten friendly meals in Walt Disney World. Just go to the boathouse. Um, just go right to the boathouse. They have everything that you need right there. I've been going a lot and that's not a bad thing. I've had a lot of like one-on-one -on -one coaching meetings there and it's not it's not awful because if you're going to meet anywhere, you might as well go to the boathouse and uh, go on Sunday, by the way. If you get a chance to go on Sunday, go on Sunday for their brunch. It is outstanding. By the oh, way, speaking of which, um, our first event back is actually this Sunday. Uh, we are going to be having our private breakfast in the Donut Garden. This event did, as expected, sell out very, very, very fast. If you join the wait list, I have your name. If anything happens and somebody does uh, drop out, you will certainly be uh, added and brought in, uh, have the opportunity to buy your tickets. But it is, a, like I said, it is a, um, it is a very... Small event uh, by design um, and by necessity, but if this goes well, fingers crossed that it does, um, this will be the first of many as we start getting back into doing events. And if you're coming, we've got some surprises as well for the, uh, the Donut Garden event. So, uh, Dan, it should be at race weekend. That's why I picked this weekend. Uh, instead of running, I thought eating was a much better choice so for those who are going to be here getting i know some people are going to be getting together probably running on saturday godspeed to you um for those of you who want to be eating you come to the event on sunday uh matthew i probably won't be live on sunday uh, i might take some video and share it but it's really hard for me sometimes and understand where i'm coming it's hard for me and i think it's unfair to try and balance paying attention to the live stream while also paying attention and sort of being present for the people who are there. So it's really difficult for me to do that. Um, and I don't think it's fair to, to the people who are there or the people who are watching if I'm not able to be fully attentive to it. So um, I'm not going to go live on this Sunday, but I am looking so forward. I'm looking so forward, not just to my donuts, not just to my coffee, and I should put S's on the, I'll make those plural, but really just to seeing people again in what is going to be a very safe environment, I promise you. So, uh, Chris Reynolds, you and I are friends because you say things like eating is reverse Pac-Man, greater than running, greater than running. Uh, Martin Shergold from the United Kingdom, good morning to you as well. So, Anyway, so if you enjoyed this week's podcast about the secrets and illusions of Magic Kingdom, if you'd like us to continue on in our journey, going to secrets and illusions of places like Epcot Center, the other parks, there's even some secrets and illusions in some of the resorts. Um, and there's actually a couple of really good ones outside the parks and resorts too. Disney Springs Water Parks, 
I'm looking at you. So if you dig them, let me know. More importantly, if you please can help spread the word, uh, that is so, so very helpful, uh, not just to me, but to us as a community as well. Um, where are we going to go from here? You know what? Look, let's 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 get to the uh, let's get to sort of the the elephant in the room, which is our Disney Plus pick of the week, which is of course WandaVision once again. Because how could it not be WandaVision once again? If you and I understand, WandaVision is not everybody's cup of tea. I totally get it, and it's cool. Um, that is fine. I love 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 WandaVision. I think I am. Uh, very much not alone in this, judging by uh, not just, and I try and, I don't, I don't pay too much attention to what's happening on social, but I do pay attention to the common conversations that are happening in the clubhouse. And I'll tell you, I have not had uh, this much fun watching a TV show as I've had since I watched Lost for the very first time. And the brilliance and the storytelling and the writing, and I love the fact that it was not all released at once, because we haven't had the same type of water cooler conversations. For me, it's lost. For other people, it's Twin Peaks. Somebody else I was talking to today said, I feel the same way about 24. I love the fact that we have this week to sort of digest and dissect, you know, frame by frame. And we've got social media now and so many very smart, very creative people, clearly who love their comic books, by the way, who are able to dig down super deep, uh, even deeper than those of us who are, you know, quote, I, I call myself a casual fan because I certainly cannot quote, you know, uh, chapter and verse of every comic book that is being referenced here, but there is some amazing things. And what I love is you can enjoy things like WandaVision on its surface. Um, and again, I know, understand not everybody's a, a, a superhero fan, a Marvel Cinematic Universe fan, the first two episodes you very much had to buy into, especially if you were not a fan. But I think that was an investment very, very much worth making uh, because I have not had as much fun watching a show over and over again. I've watched the last episode. Now I've watched it five times. I've watched the last single episode five times, and I do not watch a lot of TV. But I watched it three times on Friday. I watched it once on Saturday, and I've watched it one other time since then. Um for work purposes, not even for work purposes, because I love it. I loved it so much, and I love sort of digging a little bit deeper. So I want to know um, what your thoughts are on WandaVision. And this is going to be a very spoiler-filled discussion, so if you don't want to know, I, I, I won't go too spoilery, but um, I think there's some interesting conversations to be had. I think one of the things that was really fun about this week was the commercial. Um in terms of what does this commercial mean? There's been theories about each of the prior commercials representing one of the Infinity Stones, representing traumas in Wanda's life. Um, there was an interesting conversation I had with somebody earlier today. Um, you know, do the characters inside Westview, are they aware of the commercials? Like, are they aware of what is going on? And if not, then who are the commercials for? If she's making these commercials, maybe she's not. Maybe the commercials are coming from somewhere else. Um, who are the commercials being made for? Are they being made by Wanda? Are they being made by Hydra? Are they being made by S.H.I.E.L.D.? Are they being made by Mephisto? Um, what does Yo Magic mean? Um, I, I have, and I don't normally like get excited when I have a theory, but I had a theory about the Yo Magic commercial, and the more I thought about it, like, I never write blog posts because I'm awful at typing and I would rather just communicate this way, but the more I thought about the WandaVision commercial, I, I was asking myself all of these different questions, and I ended up writing a blog post about it, and it was interesting to sort of see and hear and talk with other people about what their theories are about who did the little boy on the island represent? What did he represent? Uh, who or what did um, did the shark represent? Uh, I think, and this may be a spoiler alert warning, um, and if you read the blog post, I'm just going to sort of repeat it. I think that the boy is Wanda, and I think that the shark is the devil. And by the devil, I mean it could be the devil, it could be Mephisto, and the reason why is that I think 
that what is happening in Westview is not solely due to what Wanda is doing. I think Wanda made a Faustian deal with the devil, we'll call him Mephisto, in order to be able to do some of the things that she needs to do, including resurrect Vision, right? We, we heard multiple times that, you know, you can't resurrect the dead. Well, maybe she couldn't do it alone. Maybe she needed help at creating this pretend life that she wanted so desperately. And if you read any of the versions of the, the, the Faust book uh, by Marlowe or Goethe, Faust was this, this very successful but yet very unhappy man who made a deal with the devil for his soul in exchange not just for knowledge but for magic, which we can certainly see some parallels here. And I think Wanda did the same thing. I think Wanda was so grief-stricken, which is what the, the early commercials are talking about, right? Each one talks about a, a major grief moment in her life, um, and including the loss of her brother. Um, in order for her to be able to have the life that she dreamed of, she needed to make this deal. And I think the reason why, obviously, the, 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 the sitcoms are the way they are is because I think, and this is not a, a Lou theory, I think it's sort of a prevailing theory, that these are shows that either she watched while she was growing up. I think these are also TV shows that she watched while she was on the run with Vision. Um, you know, if you think back to Infinity War, and they talked about sort of being on the run together, stealing time, as it were. I think, especially now, as we start getting to, you know, the 90s reruns, those are things that she might have been watching. But I think, like Dr. Faustus, like Faust, time is running out. And the, the, the dark magic that she was given um, is starting to unravel. So... Basically, Westview came to be because Wanda, in her grief, makes a deal with the devil. She gets this perfect life, or at least the illusion of it. And Mephisto, the devil, Nightmare, whoever it is, not only feeds on Wanda's magic, much like the, the boy in the, in the commercial, but Mephisto is going to be getting her children in return. Right? Agnes said, the devil's in the details. That's not only where he lives. I think the devil's and I think the details are in the yogurt. And uh, we're about to take a very, very dark turn in, uh, in WandaVision, which I love because we have gone in the MCU from these sort of very earthbound stories to things that happen in space. We start going into the multiverse. Now we're getting into a much stranger, not, well, maybe pun intended, sort of spiritual, metaphysical look at what might be happening in the real world, if you can call New Jersey the real world. Um, so uh, all I know is that Friday doesn't come fast enough. Like I woke up and I was like, oh, it's like I'm happy that it's Wednesday and I'm sad that it's Wednesday because I look so forward um, to it. And I think, too, whether you agree or, or disagree with my theory, again, a lot of the prevailing theories that are out there certainly is about Mephisto, possibly Nightmare. Um, I think it's, I th my feeling is it's 97.2% going to be Mephisto, uh, is going to be sort of the puppet master. Now, is Mephisto somewhere that we've seen already? Is Mephisto Dottie? It could be. Agnes said that um, Dottie runs this town. And if you, if you think back to last week's episode, I'm not sure about Agnes anymore in terms of her control. Is she as evil as we were all led to believe? I'm not sure. And the other thing that I thought about, and I was talking about this today with someone, was I think we are being misdirected, like a lot. And I think Marvel's laughing at us while they're doing it. And the reason why was because last week, episode six, when they were when Wanda and Pietro were sitting down talking about their memories of growing up and Sokovia and what Halloween was like. Wanda didn't remember, yet we were thrown into this this illusion, maybe, of a memory of them in war torn Sokovia walking up to that old woman's house and paying very close attention to the posters that are behind. Her. <clears throat> Excuse me, but 
She literally hands him a fish. She hands him a herring. And later on, Wanda talks about turning somebody into a pickled herring. She actually talks about turning, actually turns it, turning um, uh, Pietro into a pickled herring. I think that it is a a backhanded. I don't want to call it, like it's a backhanded joke saying we all think that this is something that appears as obvious that it is, but there really are red herrings, and we everything that I'm saying. Everything that I'm writing might be completely wrong. And you know what? I don't care because I am having so much fun watching this show, talking about it with friends, spending hours on Messenger or text or even talking like with my, my kids about it, having so much fun pulling this show together, watching it frame by frame, hearing what other people's opinions are. And, and that is what I, I love about this um, so very much. Um, Lou needs to do a, Wanda, a, a WandaVision character background live show. I'm, I am probably not the person to do it. Like I have a, you know, I, if, if you were sort of measuring my, my, my Marvel nerdiness in terms of knowing the stories, like having read the comics, I'm, I'm maybe like a solid five. Right. There are people um, that are way smarter that have read the House of M, have read all these other ones. Look, you know, I think we're we're and this is, again, not a Lou theory. I think this is very apparent. We are very much on the cusp of the introduction of the X-Men um, in a number of different ways. Right. I think that Monica's contact, the person she was going to meet is most likely going to be Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four. And yes, I'm going to say it again, that um, Inspiration Four, that that um, Super Bowl commercial, which I saw again and that I wrote about in the clubhouse, I may be completely wrong, but that stinks like something is rotten in Denmark. I believe that that Inspiration Four thing, and I know it's with St. Jude Hospital, is a brilliant, brilliant, deep fake it is a um, it is a viral marketing campaign tied into some sort of experiential benefit for people that that participate. A beautiful fundraiser for St. Jude, which I love very very much. But it is going to be what helps to introduce the Fantastic Four and tie it in here and with everything else. Or I could be completely wrong, and it's Doctor Doom, and who knows? But it doesn't matter. Um, I, I still think it is. Um, smart all around from beginning to end. And I don't care if any of my theories are wrong because, man, I haven't had this much fun watching TV in a long, long time. Um, and, and again, I know I don't watch a ton of TV, but um, so Matthew says, uh, anybody think Darcy going into the hex is going to give her powers or change her in some way? So that's really interesting because if you pay very close attention, when they were talking about Monica going... Monica so far has been in, been sort of uh, in and out of the hex twice. So, is that what is going to activate her mutant powers? Right, that's what I mean. This might be part of what introduces mutants into the MCU, not sort of the traditional way the sort of mutants have always been here, but something happens to your DNA. Do you have to pass through more than once? Because if not then everybody else who is in Westview, all those S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, and now Darcy, are going to be imbued with some sort of mutant abilities because they have passed through the hex. I think that has something to do with it, and I think that has something to do with the, um, with the introduction of um, not just the Fantastic Four, but the X-Men and the expanded Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and... You know, it's interesting, too, and I don't go too deep into this because, you know, if you go back in time, years before WandaVision was ever a thing, and, and Kevin Feige talks about where and how some of these earlier movies play into um, the interactions with the Marvel Cinematic Universe in terms of, of sort of retconning certain things, there's a very delicate line that he has to walk in terms of acknowledging things that have happened in the past. That's why Pietro may be the red herring. Look, Pietro is not Pietro, right? And and I know there's been a lot of talk about the Funko Pop because his name on the Funko Pop box is 
quote unquote Pietro Maximoff. Um, I think it's always been clear that Pietro is not Pietro. All right, it is somebody else's pieced together uh, memories or knowledge of who Pietro was. That's why even Pietro doesn't remember getting shot. He doesn't remember why he was there. Right, he sort of get you know a a, a a useless getting shot in the street. Well, that's not why he got shot, right? He was saving the lives of Hawkeye and that little boy in Sokovia. So there's a lot of things that I think might be red herrings and there's a lot of things that just don't make sense. And again, I, I might be completely off. Um, he's Peter. I Some people are saying he's Peter. Uh, he's our lobster. <laughs> so Brian, I didn't know this until today that Wanda and Pietro were dressed as Nick Fury and Black Widow, which makes no sense because Nick Fury and and um, they did not exist at the time that they would have been kids growing up in Sokovia, right? There was no Black Widow, right? There was no Nick Fury and Nick Fury certainly didn't have his eye patch because he didn't get that until 1995 if you paid attention to Captain Marvel and didn't sleep through it, which is very possible. Not my favorite Marvel movie, but we go on. So that's why that to me is a red herring, right? It is a false memory. And they're showing you, like they're literally showing you, this is a red herring because this never really happened, which is why Wanda doesn't remember it. It's because it did not happen. Uh, since Vision will recognize Darcy, he may take the spell off her like he did with Agnes, have her tell him everything that happened in the past with Ultra and Thanos. So... Vision doesn't remember anything before being in Westview, right? If you watch the security tape, Vision was disassembled. Um, Vision was taken apart. And Vision doesn't have the Mind Stone, right? So is he getting any of his Mind Stone powers from Wanda, who I think has sort of been imbued with the power of all the stones? I think that's what the commercials are showing us as well. I swear to God, I've kissed a girl in my life. Like, I sound like the biggest nerd ever. I'm so sorry, but I'm getting... Super excited about it. And Adam, who do I think the big cameo is at the end? I don't think it was Pietro. That's what I'm saying. I don't think, and I, and I think Dr. Strange is too obvious, right? Um, and I know um, that Paul Bettany said he was excited to work with this actor who he never worked with before. And yes, he's never worked with Benedict Cumberbatch before, at least not necessarily on, you know, on the same frame on screen. I think it's somebody else. And I know there's also been talk that this week's episode might look like something like The Office. There's going to be a lot of direct-to-camera conversation, um, like a modern family type of thing, too. Is it going to be The Office, John Krasinski, Reed Richards? I, I don't think so. It almost seems too obvious, just based on the rumors, as it were. Um, but it's um, no matter where you are, I think no matter where you are, in terms of your level of fandom, like if you're if you dig what's been happening in Marvel, you should really be digging uh, what is happening on WandaVision. And maybe maybe what I need to do, maybe you know what I'll do. If you're a member of the WW Radio Nation, maybe our next call, because I, I want to hear from you, right? I want to literally hear from you. And I, I thought about doing a call in show tonight, but it could might be, you know, um, it would be nine hours long. Maybe the next nation call this month will sort of have a, uh, a deep dive and complete snack filled, spoiler filled nerd fest with WandaVision. Um, and we'll do that probably in the next week or so. So if you're a member of the nation, stay tuned. I will send that out. I will probably um, maybe tomorrow or the next day. So, um, and maybe we'll have, <laughs> I would. I wish we could almost do like a legal betting pool to see who we think. Maybe I'll put a poll up, but you can only vote once. Who do you think, if there's going to be this big cameo at the end, which I think there will be, who do you think it is? Whether it be the actor or whether it be the character, right? The, the names that we're hearing now is Reed Richards. Uh, I think. Uh, I think Von Doom might, I think it could very well be Dr. Doom and really throw people off, which will also tie into the Dr. Strange and Spider-Man. Um, we're hearing, I, I wouldn't even call it uh, Mephisto or Nightmare as as being, um, uh, who would it? There's also been talk about it being um, uh, Matthew Fassbender. So I was trying to think of the actor's name. 
um, who's Magneto, right? Who we find out later on, and it's actually hinted to in Days of Future Past that Magneto is actually Pietro's father. So there might, I mean, there's a, a sort of a natural tie in there, comic wise. Um, whether that's retconned into what's happening in the MCU might be very interesting. But um, Adam, I agree. I hope I like Fassbender a lot. Um, I think he was some of the best parts of what sometimes were somewhat forgettable um, Fox X Men movies. Um, but yes, Matthew Woolley, I will definitely do a. <laughs> so Kira says I would laugh so hard if the cameo were Deadpool. It probably wouldn't happen. You want to talk about throwing people off, and you bring Deadpool into WandaVision, the internet would lose its collective minds for a million different reasons why. So, um, and yeah, I think Doom could certainly be in New Jersey, Chris. Um, remember, a lot of what happens happens in New York. Look, I mean, I think we already know we're going to see, and forgive me if this is a spoiler, I think we're going to see um, Daredevil in Spider Man 3. I think, and I would love if it's Charlie Cox. I think Charlie Cox was really good in that series. Like, if Daredevil is um, hired to represent Peter Parker um, based on everything that happened at the end of Far From Home. So, um, yes, Magneto is Wanda's father. Um, let's see. Let me quickly go through. Um, Peter seems like you would call Magneto Pops. Captain Caveman would be hilarious. It would... <coughs> I'm not sure if there's necessarily the Marvel... Uh, connection there. Um, I don't think they'll tie in a Star Wars episode here. Right, I, I, right. the conversation that they're saying, it's a on the level of a Mark Hamill, Luke Skywalker. So it's got to be something epic for it to be that type of a character and probably somebody that, that we've seen before, um, not somebody that has never um, been in any of the films, although I don't think it's going to be Deadpool or Spider-Ham. So... Um, why not tie a Star Wars? Kept, uh, so, Antoine, the, the, the universes and the timelines just don't match up. Uh, Star Wars happened in a long time ago in a galaxy very, very far away. So there's no way, unless we're doing some sort of weird multiverse time jumpy thing that would just make people's brains fall out of our heads. Um, and I don't think, you know, I think Star Wars and Marvel just don't exist on the same plane. And I think it would be very difficult and very muddled and confusing. Look, Marvel has you know, thousands and thousands. I mean, I think there's like 8,000 some odd characters in the Marvel comic book universe that they can pull from. Uh, I think that we're going to start getting introduced to a lot of them um, very, very soon, not just on Disney Plus, but in the films too. I think we're going to get, I think we're going to get in, especially in Spider-Man, and as you can tell, I'm a, I'm a big Spider-Man fan. Uh, I think we're going to get some very cool villains being introduced and being reintroduced in spider-man so um we i promise you we will pick if you are interested in continuing on this conversation about wandavision this is where i need to quickly go and find wait come on lewis see i need like a producer or something wait wait where is it come on jeez louise uh this is where you can there it is oh i didn't do it gosh i'm so bad at that Oh, wait. Oh, my God. Spoiler alert. Anyway, join the WWE Radio Nation by going to www.radionation.com. So there you go. And now I'll have to explain what that is, but you'll find out soon. Uh, but first, let's see. Do you want to go to so what's in the box? No. Let's. You know what? Instead of doing that, let's go instead. Let's go to uh, let's go do our top five live because we could end up talking about WandaVision all night long. Q Lionel Richie music here. But instead, let's go to our top five live. Instead, we'll talk each week about the best of the best of the Disney Star Wars. Um, inspired by top tens, but a little bit shorter, and just me doing them on my own. Uh, I thought a lot about what to talk about on this week's top five live, and um, I was jotting down ideas earlier today uh, all over the place and as you may have seen from the, um, the the promo image that I put up um, I think I said you gotta go and this definitely is a place that you absolutely have to go and believe it or not this is something that has been uh, asked 
of, uh, I've been asked about this literally for years, um, literally for years. Again, I apologize for the levels when I, uh, when I installed the update, it looks like it completely reset the levels on everything everywhere. So I just want to make sure you were all wide awake. Uh, but so I said, this is a place that you've got to go. These are definitely five places you've got to go in Walt Disney world and literally, literally by your request this week, I share with you the top five restrooms in Walt Disney world. You would be surprised just how many times I have gotten asked over the years to do an episode about the top five restrooms. I, I just don't think I can do a full podcast episode about it. So instead we're going to do it right here, right now. Um, and I will tell you right off the back too, uh, just to be clear and to set your expectation levels, uh, just a, a couple of things that I want to quickly share. One, uh, picking your top five restrooms is more difficult than it might seem. It's like having a favorite child. Uh, we all have one. We don't necessarily want to admit where our favorite restroom is. Um, but I think it's also something that's interesting because, I, look, there are people who work at Walt Disney Imagineering that this is their job. Like, you are going to be in charge of designing the restrooms in the Disney parks. And I think they have created some of the most imaginative and unique and well-themed bathrooms anywhere. Le leaving out Japan, obviously nothing can compete with the Japanese toilets because they warm places that need to be warmed. Then they play music and there's water and lights. I mean, it's, it, it's a very sort of interactive experience when you use the potty in Japan. Um, and uh, there were some that I thought of for the list that have been lost. There are extinct restrooms of Walt Disney World, especially in Epcot because of all the reservations, but uh, renovations. But like I said, there are no photos because like they said in Spider-Man, it's just weird. Like you just don't go into bathrooms and uh, take photos. Um, and a couple other qualifiers. There are no resort restrooms because they're not necessarily accessible to everybody. Um, and we'll maybe save that for another show, which resorts are the best bathrooms. The Cinderella, I will spoil alert. Cinderella Castle Suite is not on this list um, because it is one or technically a resort room and two, it's not accessible to everybody. So um, it is not one that any guest can go and see or any guest and go and book. Uh, Disney Cruise Line, Jennifer, not on this list as well. There are, um, you know, I'll do a, I'll do a top five resort bathrooms. I'll do a top five cruise bathrooms, top five companion restrooms in Walt Disney World and Disney Cruise Line. But, um, you know, what makes a good restroom, right? And, and this is something that I had to think about. Like I sat down, and I was like, what makes a good restroom? Um, and, and a good restroom doesn't mean, you know, like you go to a fancy restaurant and there's an attendant inside, which I always thought was weird. Like the first time I walked into a fancy restaurant and there was an attendant there, I'm like, dude, like I understand you've got mints and toothbrushes and combs and gels and lotions, but that's all sort of bizarre anyway. Um, so for me, there were a number of different qualifiers that that came into it um location theming both inside and out um the size of the restroom how crowded is the restroom you'll see as we go through my list and i would certainly want to know ones that you agree or disagree with as well and why and uh, steve shustler got to be clean i listen if i was doing my favorite restrooms in walt disney world and was including everywhere um, I do love the boathouse restrooms. I really do. Probably because that's where I spend most of my time. But anyway, by the way, Steve Schussler, I love you and I love your boathouse brunch. I'm just going on record. All right, let's get back to it. Let's get back to the top five awkward. This is my most awkward top five ever. But here it is, my top five restrooms in Walt Disney World. Coming in at number five is the Hol Hollywood Brown Derby. So if you go into, not the front, but the side entrance um, over by where the archway towards Playhouse Disney is, the restroom there is very simple. Um, it is very elegant. Uh, it has this very 20s and 30s feel to it with the black and white checkered tiles, very sort of keeping in with the, the time and, and location feel. Uh, a lot of those 
signature caricatures on the wall that you will find inside the restaurant as well. Um, it is spacious. It is not usually very crowded. And uh, even if you're not using the Brown Derby restaurant, it is a nice re restroom to use if you need to go when you know you need to go. Coming in at number four, I can't spend this much time on, on restrooms. It's just creeping me out. This is a tie. Uh, this is a tie because these two restrooms are actually, <laughs> Martin, these two restrooms are actually very similar, uh, both Galaxy's Edge and Pandora. And here, this wasn't one that, that was an interesting one to put on the list because the exteriors are very, very well themed. Right, anywhere you walk in Pandora or Batu, the exteriors are well themed. Inside is quite the opposite, but I still felt like they needed to be on the list. And the reason why is because they're very utilitarian inside, which makes sense for the places and the spaces that you are in. So these exposed weathered piping and that that sort of um, uh, that lighting that looks like it's been there and it's almost sort of um, crackling a little bit. It's very industrial and it has that uh, otherworldly, almost alien type feel to it, which fit perfectly into Galaxy's Edge and Pandora and having those sort of central sinks with the exposed pipes um, was the reason why these two made it on the list and made it on the list together. And from Galaxy's Edge, and the beautiful world of Pandora and home of Satuli Canteen, one of my favorite counter service locations anywhere in Walt Disney World. We move on to number three, Arendelle, Frozen, Norway. What I call it the call it what you want, but the Frozen restaurant. Look, a Frozen bathroom sounds like someplace you would not want to go. Like when it's cold, it's so whatever. But when you gotta let it go, you gotta go here because. What I like about these bathrooms is both inside and outside. So if you look at the outside, look at the signs for the men's and ladies' restrooms. They have signs of people who are dressed, uh, these sort of caricatures of uh, little characters dressed like cast members from the Norway Pavilion. So it's a nice tie back to Norway, which, you know, again, you sort of make the, the connections on your own between Norway and Arendelle. But I love the fact that it references the cast members. But inside, there's beautiful tile work. And for some reason, the bathroom stall doors are this wonderful shade of blue with these large hinges that sort of continue the theming that are outside the building. So there's a, a flow in terms of the storytelling, storytelling bathrooms. But there's the storytelling that happens from the outside, continues on through the inside which I like very much. Now, the next one is going to be one you're going to go, why in the world would you put this on your list? I'm not going to say go with me here, but let me explain. Because coming in at number two is Journey into Imagination. And you're probably saying, I don't even know where the Journey into Imagination restrooms even are, Mangello. And you probably don't because they're on the far right side of the Imagination Pavilion, and they're never crowded. Theming? Okay, they're fine. They're just sort of regular bathrooms. But the reason why Journey into Imagination is on my list is when you go to Epcot, don't just listen to the land, listen to the bathroom. And what I mean by that is, I told you, very awkward transitions here. The reason why is because for some reason, when the pavilion was updated in the late 90s, everything was updated, right? The attraction, fortunately or unfortunately, was updated. The theming, the story, what was not updated was this bathroom. And normally you'd say, that's a bad thing, right? Not here. Because for some reason, I don't know if it was intentional or they were able to just sort of slip it through. But when you go to the bathroom, listen to the background music. And this ties into our The Music of Future World uh, episode that we did however many weeks ago it was. World Showcase is coming soon, I promise. But if you listen, it has the original Journey into Imagination background loop. 
uh, with a wonderful arrangement of One Little Spark by the Sherman Brothers. I'm not telling you to hang out in the bathrooms because, once again, very creepy. Probably going to get security called on you. But if you do happen to spend a little bit more extra time in there, really pay attention, not necessarily to what you see. <laughs> again, <laughs> pay attention. To, pay to, hopefully there's nobody else in there. Man, this is so bad. Pay attention to not what you see. Pay attention to what you hear in the bathroom. I've got to move on because I'm, I'm incredibly embarrassed at this point. Um, so moving on to the number one, this should come as no surprise, I think, to anybody at all, but it's the Tangled Toilets, um, in New Fantasyland. I think that the Tangled restrooms look like an attraction or an attraction queue themselves. The exterior with those lanterns is beautiful at night. I, look, it's the only bathroom that has a photo op at it, so but you've got these wonderful hidden details, the theming both inside and out, Rapunzel's drawings, again, on the exterior and the interior, the wanted poster, great little hidden details. You've got the scavenger hunt for Pascal, plus you've got the seating area with the phone charger. Like, the tangled restrooms are an attraction in and of themselves because, again, when you go to do what you have to do, there's other things you could do while you're there. <clears throat> and these will admittedly sometimes be crowded, especially during uh, at night when they've got the lantern photos um, and, and, and because of where it is, because of the size that they are. <laughs> like, I think this is a bad... Listen, some, some people are worth melting for, some restrooms are worth waiting for. And I think the Tangled Restroom, especially if you were a fan of the film or the characters, the Tangled Restroom is worth waiting for. It has everything that you need. It's got outdoor seating areas. It's got covered areas. It's got the charging stations. It's got the photo opportunities. It's got the scavenger hunt. It's got the the, um, the uh, little waterfall and the brook. It's got great little hidden details. So without question, the number one restroom in Walt Disney World has to be um, the Tangled Restrooms. But wait, there's more because how could we not have... <laughs> Excuse me. How could we not have? I'm laughing at that. Lou sent me. Um, how could we not have uh, honorable mentions when we're talking about the favorite restrooms in Walt Disney World? So we're going to. And my honorable mentions for the top five restrooms in Walt. Derek says nothing. Wait, nothing screams bathroom. <coughs> Excuse me. Like a selfie wall. Um. So the honorable mentions for the bathrooms, and there's not one, but two. And the first is World Showplace. And did you know, did you know that the World Showplace Pavilion in Epcot has the largest bathroom in all of Walt Disney World? There are 18, count them, 18 places to sit and place and 18 places to Stand up and do, look, I can only speak to the men's room. I can't speak to the ladies' room. And I'm not saying that I counted, but there I have a number. So it's huge. It's, dare I say, cavernous. And when there's nobody in there, you could like, it's like a roller rink in there. Uh, not that I suggest roller skating in the men's room, but Jeffrey Whale, it's the biggest bathroom because it's the biggest bathroom. Uh, because that is been yeah that, that space has been used for uh convention and meeting and event spaces and so you need you can fit a lot of people in world show show place and you needed a restroom facility inside and uh and the bathrooms are, are huge so uh that is the largest bathroom in world show place i think the bathroom that is most well received and was celebrated was Flight of Passage. And I'm not talking about the Flight of Passage restrooms outside the attraction, but the Flight of Passage ones that are located inside the queue. If you think back, I was going to say last year, but it was really 2019, it, right before you get to that transition into the bioluminescence section of the queue, a little bit, it's about a little bit more than halfway through, there is, you almost hear the Pandoran little angels sing because there is this brightly lit, um, large enough to accommodate 
restroom right in the queue. So if somebody needs to go and you've been waiting in that queue pre-pandemic, you've been waiting in that queue for a long period of time, it's really nice and I think very, very smart of Disney to have been able to bump out that spot and put um, a, a well-needed um, and very, very well-received uh, place for respite uh, in the middle of the queue. And I honestly think that that's something that we might see happen again in some of the, the e-ticket attractions. So here you go. Here's my list. Hollywood Brown Derby, a tie. My first tie, I think, between Galaxy's Edge and Pandora. The Arendelle restrooms, the Frozen slash Norway restrooms in Epcot Center. Journey to Imagination, not for the uh, quality of the toilet tissue, but for the quality of the background music in there. And number one, the Tangled Toilets in Fantasyland with honorable mentions to the only mid Q restroom that I can think of and the largest restroom in the World Showcase show, show case in Walt Disney World. I will post this in the clubhouse. I want to hear your thoughts. What restroom is your favorite? Why? What am I missing? Look, I know that there are arguments could be made for the Adventureland Breezeway bathrooms uh, over by the Swiss Family Treehouse. Uh, there are some other ones that are smaller, uh, ones that are a little bit more out of the way that don't get crowded. But this is my list. I will post this here in the group, and I would love to, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts, Jennifer Morris Lee. It, it absolutely, this talk has definitely made us family. Way more information than you probably ever wanted to hear about uh, Lou Mangiello and his favorite bathrooms. But there you go. Steve Chumley says Pizza Rizzo upstairs. Really nice bathrooms because nobody ever goes. And they're very, very well air-conditioned, in, especially in the summertime. So I totally read that first sentence wrong at first. I'm not – what I'm now – now I'm top five restrooms. You got me second-guessing what I wrote there, but I don't know what it uh, – there's a bathroom in the Stormtrooper room on Rise of the Resistance. Is there? Uh, American Pavilion bathrooms did not make it. Grace, uh, listen, I, I dig them because they are spacious. They are air conditioned. They are very much out of the way. They don't normally get very crowded except during festival time. But it's a top five. Not everything can make the list. So don't hate on me because I uh, because I did not add your favorite to the list. But there you go. So I want to hear... Uh, I want to hear what your thoughts are in terms of what your favorite. I told you, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight, a lot of interesting conversations to be had to. Um, you, oh, stop it. You probably did not ever expect me to uh, talk about my favorite restrooms in Walt Disney World. So uh, you may have actually, all right, so there's a little bit of the, the cat is out of the bag. There's a little bit out of, the box, as it works, you might have seen the graphic that uh, popped up very quickly. <laughs> Mike, I see your I see your response, but I can't post it. It is a very uh, yes, I get you. Although I wish the only thing I wish is that the toilets in Japan were like the toilets in Japan, because then I would literally never leave Katsura Grill, my favorite place for all, I, not for the bath, whatever. Anyway, so you uh, you may have seen that graphic. There's something I wanted to share. And I've never, I literally have never done this before. And I have been doing this a long time. I've been doing this, um, you know, audio, video, all this stuff going back to 2004. I have never done an unboxing video. Like, I literally don't know what I'm doing here going forward. But um, I did get something in the mail. Um, and... Let me first preface this by saying I never, um, I never advertise or partner with anybody that I don't use and that I don't like. Um, so uh, I'm going to be doing an unboxing from from a company that I have bought from before, um, and I've seen their stuff before at uh, at cons, at different exhibits. Um, I've bought these as gifts for other people. Uh, my brother and I are big sort of. Um, comic book, Marvel, sci-fi nerds, shocker of all shockers. So I've given these as, as gifts before, um, and I really, really like the quality of their stuff. And 
uh, actually at D23 Expo last year, and I know some of you were here, were either watching or were with me, uh, over in the corner, over by where the Parks and Resorts exhibit was, there was this amazing display of these incredibly lifelike collectibles, and the scales go from very small to literally full-size figures. Uh, and so this week, I got a box in the mail from them. I got a box in the mail from Sideshow Collectibles. Um, I don't know if you've ever if you ever heard of Sideshow before. Let me know in the comments. Um, they have an incredible collection of normally limited editions of, uh, of figures and statues and artwork and prints and jewelry and replicas of different things. Um, they have some. I think they have some clothing merch there too. But really, what they're known for is the exceptional quality and detail of the replicas that they make. Um, I bought a, a Marvel statue for somebody a couple of years ago and was amazed at, like I've never seen anything as detailed. And if you saw that quick picture that, that popped up when I wasn't sort of ready for it to pop up, you saw just how detailed it was. So um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to unbox what, uh, what I received from Sideshow Collectibles and, and Louis Ramos says, what's in the box? I'm hoping that it's not a, a replica from the movie Seven but I'll take my sort of little uh, mini katana letter opener here. And uh, like I said, bear with me because I've, I've literally never done an, an unboxing before. So, and there might be nothing in here. I mean, I know, I know that there's something in here, but because I opened it up just to make sure that there was something in here other than like a subpoena. So, I don't think it's box wine. <laughs> it's not Vision's head. How, how creepy are you guys? Oh. Oh, so wait a minute. So this very much is, this very much ties into um, my super, listen, if you thought that, <coughs> if you thought that my Marvel nerdiness was coming out, you're going to wonder how and why, oh, wait, how and why and when um, anybody in their life ever actually dated me. Um, so, I guess, oh, yeah, I guess I'm supposed to show you what it is. So, this is from Battlestar Galactica. And this is a replica of the Battlestar Galactica from the original 1978, which is what I grew up with. Um, it is the original 1978 show. I don't if you remember with Lauren Green, um, Dirk Benedict, um, and actually, um, you may or may not realize that um, Rick Springfield actually appeared. Not only did Rick Springfield, but Ed Begley Jr. Ed Begley was in like the first four episodes. Rick Springfield was in like the first two, and then just disappeared or was killed by Cylons somewhere. So. This is a replica. Battlestar Galactic basically was a story by Glenn A. Larson, who also did um, Buck Rogers. It came out in 1978, um, very much in the wake of Star Wars, but actually the original um, story for Battlestar Galactic was written pre-Star Wars. It was actually a huge lawsuit. Um, uh, the, the Fox was sued by um, Lucasfilm, and then they countersued, and they eventually ended up working it out. But all right, it doesn't really matter, because I'm really curious to see what this looks like um, and you can see sort of get a, an idea of the scale of what it is chuck Kleinberg, apollo starbuck uh, do you remember the first couple of episodes um oh my god what was her name she, um she was dr quinn medicine woman um i'm just drawing a blank on her name she was super pretty and she's like 70 years old and still super pretty um i'll remember it in a second but uh, mike goldchap says glenn dykstra did the effects um, Christopher Manning, thank you. Um, now wait, so I'll, I'll nerd out for a second. So Battlestar Galactica, it basically was this tribe that um, their home planet was destroyed and there are these, this ragtag group of ships that are trying to find this lost 13th colony, which is Earth, that's us. And the whole season, there was only one season, was them trying to find their way back. But of course, there's bad guys, the Cylons, who were being led by a human who was a traitor, a traitor, but there was actually one of the Cylons, like a, um, 
His name was Lucifer. And I should have brought up, oh, if I would have known. Next week, I'll show you my figures. Um, Lucifer was actually voiced by the guy who did Dr. Smith from Lost in Space. So Jane Seymour, Jane Seymour. Thank you so much, Jane, if you're watching. I'm sorry, call me. Um, so here, so you get a little, uh, you get a little official ship collection. Oh, it's like a whole like, oh my God, the little dog too. Like the little daggett. So you get, oh, you get this cool. All right, wait, let's just get to it. Let's just get to it. Oh my God, that's awesome. That is crazy. Oh wow, it's heavy. So I don't know if you can see. So that is the Galactica. It looks like it's about, probably about 10, 12 inches long, somewhere there. It's like a heavy die cast metal, really uh, very detailed. Oh, that's super cool. That is, and it comes with the stand. Wait, and if you don't believe, wait, I just thought about this. If you don't believe that I'm actually a Battlestar Galactica fan. These are actually my original from when I was a kid. These are my 1978 Battlestar Galactica toys. Still with the rocket firing missile. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. From the Cylon Raider and the Colonial Viper. Uh, when I went up to my mom's house in New Jersey after she passed uh, a few months ago, these were still in my toy trunk, stickers on it and everything. So uh, of all the things, excuse me, that I saw when I went up there, I, I, I'm, you're my friend, you're my family, I'm happy to admit, like I saw these and that's what made me cry. Um, was seeing these like still in the toy box that I had when I was a kid. Um, but this is very cool. This will be a nice addition, uh, a new addition to my original collection. Uh, and these, like I said, this comes from Sideshow Toys. Now I have to bring up the graphic. Wait a minute. Now let me bring up the graphic. Hold on a second. So these are from Sideshow Collectibles. Um, and if you go to www.radio.com slash Sideshow, you can check out their collection that has um, not just nerdy things like Battlestar Galactica, but Marvel, Star Wars, a lot of Disney stuff in there as well. Becky Mankin, I made this graphic just for you because they've got this guy, and this is not a scene out of a movie. This is, this is actually how detailed the figures look. It's crazy just how good these figures really look. And when you see them in person, they are remarkable. Uh, but they also have a number of Disney ones as well in terms of statues. <laughs> Somebody, she says, it's not Sideshow Bob, it's Sideshow Collectibles. Uh, if you go to www.com slash Disney side, you can go and see their entire, and just you can do it. If you do Disney side, it'll take you right to their Disney collection. If you go to www.com slash Sideshow, it'll take you right to the main page and you can just search for, it. right, Becky? Becky, and... If you go and look at Thor, there's all kinds of little accessories that come with him. There's like lightning and there's Mjolnir and there's Stormbreaker and the iPad. There's, it's crazy how cool some of these are. This is going to be the most expensive thing I've ever gotten because it's going to cost me so much more to buy. But they have a huge collection of Disney items, <coughs> excuse me, as well. And it ranges in terms of prices from... Um, I think this Battlestar Galactica thing, I think this is like 50 bucks somewhere around there, but they also go up from there. But you can just see not just the quality, but the detail that they have in here. And I think there's probably, I think there's maybe 150, 170 or so different Disney items. Michael Goldtrap said they did some awesome Tron figures, which now I'm sad or happy that I've never seen before. And they have classic Mickey stuff in there as well. They also have stuff from the theme parks. So these are the hitchhiking ghosts. They also just introduced last week this cool haunted mansion uh, bucket, which you can go and check out. And I think that has one more. Yeah, so they even have like classics, sorcerer Mickeys as well. So 
Go check them out. They are at www.radio.com slash sideshow. I ask that you please use that link because it helps everybody um, in the long and the short term. Uh, you don't have to tell them Lou sent you because that tells them that Lou sent you. And um, if you do have anything from Sideshow, I would love for you to share a photo in the clubhouse and let me know either what you have in your collection or <coughs> excuse me, what you get from Sideshow. And if you want to go right to the Disney stuff, you can just go to www.radio.com slash Disney side and you can show your Disney side show. Get it? Your Disney side, whatever. Um, and they also have fine art prints and stuff, too. I didn't get a chance to make graphics for. So if you're looking for artwork, they've got that kind of stuff, too. So huge thanks to the folks over at Sideshow Collectibles. And yeah, that's a Mandalorian figure with this incredibly detailed little mini Baby Yoda Grogu, wherever you might be. But we'll only see you again, Baby Yoda. So there you go. So, oh, I'm so excited. Like, I'm, I, when we're done here, I need to sort of move some stuff around. And put, I'm going to put the Galactica right in between my little uh, Colonial Viper, which I'm now tempted to, I want to shoot the little rocket to show you that it still shoots, but I don't because it hasn't been fired in like, uh, it's like a week, but before that it was like 40 years. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of, of Battlestar Galactica. Um, <coughs> again, growing up, didn't date a lot, watched a lot of TV back then. Battlestar Galactica was one of my favorite shows. And they actually did a, they did a, a reboot back in 2000. Well, they did the, the, the miniseries in 2003. I think the series came out in 2004. And there's a rumor that they're rebooting Battlestar Galactica again. So we might get a, a, an updated version. Same thing, there might be a new version of Buck Rogers that might be coming out. And I loved Buck Rogers in the 25th century. However, if you go back and you can find old episodes, and this is not an affiliate thing, but if you, you can find old episodes on Peacock, um, not all of those episodes hold up. Not all those episodes hold up. Aaron Gray. Aaron Gray holds up. Um, I wanted to be Aaron Gray's friend more than... But next week, somebody remind me, because next week when I, when I went to my mom's house, in that trunk were also... And I decided over the last couple of weeks, I'm not going to put these up on eBay. Um, I was going to, and, and I just... I have too much of an emotional connection to them and attachment to them. But... Uh, all my original Star Wars figures, they're still, they're mint on card. They're unpunched. Same thing with my Battlestar Galactica figures. And I've got a couple, I've sold a couple of Buck Rogers figures, but I still have Tweaky. So I'll bring those up and uh, and I will show you now that I've decided not to sell them. I, I'll keep them for sentimental reasons and then pass them on to my kids who will probably sell them. Like they'll be listing them on eBay at my wake. So um, pay attention for those if you're interested. So uh, huge, huge thanks to Sideshow Collectibles for my classic Battlestar Galactica. I'm going to, I think I'm going to need another shelf after all. So uh, what do you collect? What kind of stuff do you collect <coughs> if you are a collector? Is it artwork? Is it, uh, better yet, is there anything nostalgic that you collect, whether it be Disney or otherwise, or uh, toys from your childhood that you still have or you wish that you still had. Paul Clark, I was actually very transparent about it. Um, I had all my stuff out like while I was single and while I was married. And trust me, man, there was some weird stuff that came with me when I was like, listen, um, I have a lightsaber and a katana and the katanas. I, it's up there now. But um, like this is stuff that is who I am and it's it's what I do. So um <coughs> Excuse me, um, Becky. This the, the statues there are amazing, and some of the big ones, if you have room for them and budget for them, some of the big ones are in. You would walk up to them, much as we did at at Expo. You walk up to them and are convinced that there's a person in the in a costume, because that's how realistic they look. So when it says that they're premium figures, they are without a doubt. I'm so excited about my Battlestar Galactica. You have no idea. Like my little nerdy, let's see, 78, so I was 10. My little 10-year-old <clears throat> nerdy heart is just swelling with joy right now. Um, it, it is. Sometimes it's a little things that, that bring back memories and make me uh, super happy. So we're going to do a uh, – so we did a show a few weeks ago about um, things that we collect um, – 
with with I knew with Connor Brown from W Opinion, um, but I definitely want to see. And tonight might be a good way, sort of based on the the I've been purging, but now I have a new edition. Uh, this is called the Hero Collection, um, and I'm, I I think this is a limited. I don't know if this is a limited edition or not. A lot of the stuff from Sideshow is limited edition. So, which is a, a pro tip. If you see something there that you like, get it. Because when it sells out, it sells out. And you don't want to be beholding to the dudes and dudettes on eBay um, who will not be selling it for the same price. I see there's a lot of Lego fans in there. Um, I, I did. I was too as a big... My son has a ton of Lego that he built uh, in his room that we have shelves that we, we put up um, displaying all of his Lego. So um, check the Galactica landing page. Oh, wait, check the Galactica landing. Really? My, like on this? Wait. This is, see, for years I've been saying that I want to start like a retro 70s and 80s podcast or something, and this is why. God, this is so nice. This is so nice. I don't know if you can see the details. But it is crazy. And you can find, if you're interested, and nobody else probably is other than me, but you can find the original Battlestar Galactica for free on the NBC app. I'm not saying that I rewatched it uh, a month or two ago. And do me a favor. Only watch the original from 1978. Do not, under any circumstances, watch that atrocity that was Galactica 1980. Uh, they canceled it after the first season. It was really one of the first letter-writing campaigns. Um, fans wanted Galactica to come back, and they couldn't. They didn't have the budget for it. NBC's like, fine, we'll do it, but you get like $6 a week to do it. And it was awful. None of the original actors except Lauren Green and uh, one other guy was, was Colonel Ty. Was, no, um, Boomer was back. And it was like, oh, we found Earth, and here's all adventures on Earth, and we're going to go meet these Cub Scouts. Like, it was really, really, really bad to the point that it was unwatchable. So, but check out the original, and then go check out the, um, I will tell you that the the remake that they did, um, it lasted four seasons, is some of the best sci-fi TV ever. Take that, Babylon 5, and some of the other more modern ones, so... Chuck Leinberg, right? You know, 80 Galactica was a disaster. It's, so that's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be this time-traveling thing. They didn't have the budget, and they spent it on Quantum Leap instead. It was, yeah, 80 was it, it was awful. We'll have to start a separate conversation somewhere about um, these. Yeah, you wanted Sam to go home in Quantum Leap, and he never did. And then actually, Scott Bakula ended up helming one of the Star Trek, um, one of the Star Trek ships a number of years later, so... There you go. Not, um, it's a different type of bad. It's worse because it lasts longer. And I think they canceled it after eight or so episodes. There was The only one that was good was the very last one. It was the return of Starbuck. And it was this story that Starbuck actually hadn't died. <gasps> Shocker, Starbuck's alive because it's Dirk Benedict and he's so handsome. And he basically, it was like enemy mine. Like he crashes on this planet and there's a Cylon there. And he brings the Cylon back to life and they become friends. It was so bad. So, so bad. But there you go. Um, big left turn. Big, big left turn off of all of the Disney stuff. But uh, but who cares? I saw somebody ask. So, yeah, the link again to check out the Sideshow stuff is www.com slash Sideshow. So, Kira, uh, I was a huge fan of Vincent. I have a Vincent Funko over there and in my closet. I have not one, not two, but three different Vincent figures. Um, he did not, he unfortunately didn't make the cut when the big black um, cube thing behind me left. So, but uh, I do, I love Vincent. Uh, Vincent, by the way, um, voiced by um, Ronnie McDowell and um, Slim Pickens was the voice of Bob. Slim Pickens was the, the, both of them uncredited. It's a very bizarre ending. It's a, I know Becky still to this day does not forgive me for making her watch that. But um, so Chuck Leinberger, um, the person who did actually the person who did the um, oh god his name just it's Sam oh gosh. His name just escaped my mind. Um, the person who did the score 
and the soundtrack for Buck Rogers also did it for Battlestar. The theme for the original Battlestar Galactica is so good. It's Stu. Um, gosh, it's going to drive me crazy. Stu something. Um, Zach Brown. Yeah, poor Bob. Poor Bob. Got a got a got a bad. Um, so Andrew Prince says Dick Van Dyke's son was in Battlestar Galactic 80. Oh, gosh. It was the and then the, the kid the, from the Brady Bunch, who was like this kid that was also an adult who had telepathic power. It was insanely bad. Stu Phillips, Stu Phillips, Chris Chapman, give yourself a dollar. Um, Becky Mankin, you'll thank me one day when you have an appreciation for all the beautiful this that. Uh, Disney Infinity has a Vincent toy character. <gasps> I might have to look on eBay for him just to add him to my little Vincent collection. There's a really cool, I mean, he's, I can't reach him. He's way up there. But there's a really cool Vincent pop. Um, I might need to get a Cylon pop just to add him to my collection now. Stop it, Mangello. You're supposed to be purging the collection, not adding to it. Oh, by the way, yeah, speaking of which, um, there are still 10 new items. I didn't mean this, but there are still 10 items, new items this week. Um, wide variety of stuff. Very, very wide variety of stuff. This week, including some Funko Pops. So, uh, Jeremy Chappelle, I watched every single episode of Sliders, and that too is on. Uh, that's on the Peacock app, which is way better than the NBC app. Again, I don't watch a lot of TV. I watch it late at night before I'm falling asleep. The NBC app is is not great. It has like six commercials every like twelve minutes, but Sliders is on for free on the Peacock the Peacock app. Um, and then there's that sliders had good season and bad seasons. Um, there were there were seasons that I liked better, partially because of who the the cast was. Um, but yeah, um, Jerry o Jerry O'Connell was great in Sliders. Martin loved Quantum Leap. You get it free if you have Comic. Oh, there you go. Uh, turn your camera around and show up. No, 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 no. No, no, you, because you want to see that. You can't see that. Uh, Peacock is not on Amazon Fire yet. You, Chuck, if you have, um, depending on your TV, and if you have like a, a Fire Stick, uh, do they have where you can sort of push from your phone? You can sort of broadcast, because you can do that like with Apple. You can like have something on your phone and then push it right to either your TV or Apple TV device. Um, I've never seen Schitt's Creek. I, I did not like Stargate SG-1. I liked Stargate the movie. Starring Ultron, but I did not. I never got into the uh, the series. So, can we talk sports just to even this out a bit? Uh, football season starts. Uh, the The draft is in two months. So, there you go. Come on, Saquon Barkley. Come on back, Big Daddy. Um, Why do I have a hard time? You believe me? Don't watch the uh, Becky. It's true. Like all day, every day. This is where you'll find me. I, for a change of pace, sometimes I'll go downstairs and I'll sit on the couch and I'll have something playing in the background. But other than that, it's only before I fall asleep at night um, or WandaVision. That's it. So um, I never watch Babylon 5. Uh, I don't watch Shit's Creek. I know my wife watches it, um, but I don't. Scott Wortman says Star Wars or Marvel. So <clears throat> 1983, Lou Mangello would have said Star Wars. Um Lou Mangiello in 2021 and for the probably the past since the, the prequels came out um, like way, way, way on Marvel. The Mandalorian and what has been coming out around that has for me rekindled a love for Star Wars, but it'll never be what it was when I was, you know, nine years old watching that first original trilogy. So. Uh, yeah, I've never. So Antoinette Williams, I've seen I've watched the entire X-Files <clears throat> back when it was on. Um, and including the the bad movie too, um, not a hockey fan. So Lost or Battlestar Galactica? Lost is the best show ever on TV. It's hands down. It's not even it's not even close. Um, and I've said it over and over again. I'll repeat it again. I think Wandavision is what happens when Marvel and Lost have a baby. It's what we're doing now. It's the same type of excited what watch it over and over again have conversations, dig down through the details, get excited for what's to come. Uh, I have not felt the same way about a TV show like I do WandaVision since I watched Lost for the first time. And then the f almost six times that I've rewatched it after. So, And I have. I've watched Lost almost six times uh, because I think it's that good. I think I think Lost is, is 
um, the best that's ever been on television. No, no, no questions asked. So I hope the payoff is better. Renata, I, you know what? I was at peace with the finale because there was nothing that they could have done in the finale that would have satisfied us. There isn't. There's nothing that, if they would have given you all the answers, it would have ruined it because, and, and Lindelof said he didn't want to do that. Like part of the fun is you trying to figure out, you and look, you know, uh, 11 years later, we're still talking about the finale of Lost. Like, you wouldn't be doing that if they gave you all the answers because you would have tied it up in a bow and you would have put it away, but it still has us thinking. It still has us questioning. It still has us trying to figure it out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which is why I think it's brilliant. I've been saying I want to do a Lost podcast. I've been thinking about doing a Lost rewatch podcast where each week we rewatch an episode and I talk about it on the show and then I remember that I don't have enough time to do the things. Look, and speaking of that, wait, very quickly, because I think there's some confusion among my friends, you, the community. A number of weeks ago, I posted something deliberately cryptic that said something small is coming. And when I announced the Everglazed event, a lot of you were like, oh, I get it. It's small because it's a donut and there's only so many few people. That's not what I was talking about. There is something I have been working on for a long time, actually, up my sleeve um, that I'm getting close to sharing with you and involving you in. It's small, small, SML, what movie? Um, but it's coming. Something else, something small is still coming. So stay tuned. I am, I am. I'm dealing with a lot. I'm pulled in a lot of different directions right now, which is why, look, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I'm not able to execute on something the right way, um, I, I'm not going to do it or I'm going to wait until I can. And that's sort of what I have been doing. But um, it, it's on the whiteboard and it's there are other planes that are already in flight with this. So um, but if anybody ever wants to talk lost, I will start a lost group on Facebook. Uh, we will break out a separate conversation. We'll do a nation call. We'll do because I could talk lost all day all night. And yes, it is Cannonball Run with one of my all time favorite singers. I don't talk about music a lot. I think Dean Martin was the best. Dare I say, dare, dare. I like Martin more than I like Sinatra. Take that, Rat Pack. If I could have ever seen a concert, it would have been, I would have seen. The Rat Pack at the Sands in Vegas. <clears throat> Mel lost his streaming on Hulu. So if you have a, if you have a Hulu um, subscription, you can watch it on Hulu, which is where I watched it. The five times I've rewatched it. It's that good. Christine, I agree. Never loved another show like that. I agree. And I love Battlestar Galactica. Not the same way. Um... And even through the writer's strike and through a lot of ups and downs and, and uh, actors growing up and actors leaving, look, uh, I think Mr. Echo, it, it's sad that he left before he was supposed to. Um, Adewa I can't pronounce his name. Adewale, uh, Mr. Echo um, was supposed to be a way bigger character. And he decided he wanted to leave. And it made me very sad because I really, really liked Echo. I love, I like that actor as well too i loved him when he was in um oz um and so was michael right michael was in oz too michael always ends up in a wheelchair this poor guy the actor always ends up in a wheelchair so heather demmett martin was a better singer than sinatra i'll i'll put that up because i agree that it's true so um and jim i i being able to rewatch lost and be now that you've watched it the first time with the the, anticip the excited anticipation of waiting week to week, being able to watch it again now is even better. Plus, you can fast forward through the really bad episode when he's in, um, oh God, when Jack goes to, um, not Singapore, um, when he goes to Bangkok. Oy, that was a bad episode. And you can fast forward through some of the flashbacks, the Jun and Sin, the Jun Sun and Jin flashbacks sometimes run a little long. That's about it. So, um, anyway. So, yeah, Mr. Echo. Um, and if you, and I don't even know if you can find Oz. Oz, not a show for the kids. 
not a show for the kids. Um, it, it, somebody mentioned that it makes the Sopranos look like Saturday morning cartoons. But uh, a lot of really good actors came from Oz, um, including, God, I'm, I'm blanking on names tonight. Um, the guy from Six Feet Under, uh, J. Jonah Jameson. Um, oh, my gosh. And I love him so much. Um, he was in Oz. Um, Michael was in Oz. Echo was in Oz. It's really, really good. I love that there's actually a great clip of The Tonight Show with what appears to be a somewhat drunk or well-acted drunk like Dean Martin uh, and Johnny Carson and Don Rickles, which is, I don't care how old you are, it is still hilarious and still holds up. Again, Disney show, I love the fact that we talk about non-Disney stuff. That's why I love you, because we could talk about... um, just a little bit of, of anything. So, uh, like the X-Files had to have a Monster of the Week episode and I love the smoke. J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons. Oh my God, he's such a good J. Jonah Jameson. He is such a good J. Jonah. When he showed up in Spider-Man Far From Home, I laughed, I cried, I was just, the cro- let the crossovers begin. Uh, Rachel says, Oz on HBO Max. Um, yeah, just, right. The guy that does the insurance commercials, who was also in later seasons of Law and Order SVU, and I know he's the insurance car guy, and I don't know what his name is. Um, he's really good too. I agree, and I do love Don Rickles, not just as Mr. Potato Head, but just Don Rickles, very, very smart, uh, very, very smart comedian. Um, talk about a comedian that would be able to, off the top of his head just rattle off such such great great humor um he was he was brilliant at it so just lost sound but have captions i did get a notice from facebook that the stream i guess there's an internet issue here it must be all this bad weather it's like 70 degrees and to all of you who are suffering in texas and the south my my heart is with you i i've I've seen some of the pictures and videos and i know it's uh it's brutal down there so um sound is fine <laughs> jk simmons in the wandavision finale count on it chris chapman if that happens i will go to boathouse and i will eat a dozen lucky duck oysters um you learn Smokey's real name lost check out lost untangled on youtube really lost untangled wait a minute yikes lost on Tangles. Uh, there's some really good Lost podcasts too. Years ago, while Lost was was happening, um, there was a the Lost podcast with Jay and Jack. They were excellent. They were excellent, excellent at it. Um, and sometimes I'll listen to some Lost stuff when I'm in my car, but I'm not in my car very much. So, and Rob, <clears throat> I, uh, I I don't miss any of that. I don't miss anything about New Jersey. So. Um, Derek needs to, needs to go back and watch. I hope you're talking about Lost. Maybe we'll, um, yeah, maybe we'll we'll talk about Lost one of these days in the clubhouse or somewhere else too. But um, anyway, it, listen, we've been going for over 90 minutes, sometimes with audio, sometimes without audio. Just a couple of quick. I don't know why it keeps popping over to here, but that's fine. Um, to Check out some of the Sideshow collectibles. You can visit www.radio.com slash Sideshow. If you want to check out the Disney stuff <clears throat> directly, go right to www.radio.com slash Disney side. It'll take you there and you can check out all of the Disney. And here's just a small smattering of what they have on the Disney side of things. Speaking of Disney, when you're looking to come to Disney, whether it be this year or you want to check out some of the new room only and packages that are available. You can go and visit my friends and yours over at Mouse Fan Travel because, you know, they're awesome. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Like I said earlier, there is uh, only now there's only one spot left. Uh, somebody unfortunately had to um, back out of the group before we started. So if you're interested in turning what you love into what you do, we have one spot left for my Tuesday night mastermind group there are only six people in it is a great way to either start 
working on your dream or pursuing your passion or building your business, I'd love to be able to help you any way that I can. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Uh, don't forget, most importantly, to please, 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 um, always, always, always choose the good in anything that you do. And uh, if you can, be the good for other people as well. Thank you so much for taking the time and tuning in tonight, for listening to the show, for being part of the community, for being my friend, for being my family, and all that you do to not just help the show and listen, but to really help spread the word. Um, you have no idea how much it's helped, how much that helps. So if you can tonight, find your, this week's show, your favorite show, one a blast from the past and share it out and invite people not just to listen, but to subscribe and become part of the community and the conversation by joining the clubhouse. And if there is any way um, that I can help you, please, please, please don't ever hesitate to reach out and let me know. I love you. I appreciate you so very much. I look forward to seeing some of you this Sunday at Everglaze in Disney Springs. I am, I am excited for my donut and just to be with people again. And other than that, I will see you guys next week. I love you. Thanks so much. See ya.